Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Welcome on behalf of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland to our first service in this centennial year. By God's grace, we desire to dedicate 2021 as a year of thanksgiving for God's gracious providence in the establishment of Northern Ireland in 1921, for the protection and prosperity he has granted these past 100 years. And we desire to seek his presence, guidance, and blessing upon the commemorative events planned by the Orange Institution and by other groups. Our first hymn has been referred to by some as the Battle Hymn of Ulster. It has frequently been sung at critical times in our history. For instance, in 1912, it was sung by the Unionist leaders at special services before the signing of the Ulster Covenant. As we sing, O God, our help in ages past, let us reflect upon those who served faithfully in defence of Northern Ireland, in the maintenance of law and order, and especially upon the many who paid the supreme sacrifice in the cause of our liberty. We realise that freedom is not free. It costs, and what a cost. O oh God, our help in ages past. Let us pray. Great God of nations, we come to you in the name of the King of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. We praise you for your many blessings. We thank you for the courage, wisdom, and determination given to our forefathers that led to the establishment of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. We rejoice that over the past hundred years, all citizens of whatever faith have enjoyed the British freedoms of civil and religious liberty. We're thankful that in the early decades, Northern Ireland was a sanctuary for many families driven from their homes due to their Protestant faith and Britishness. We're grateful for the massive contribution you have enabled people from Northern Ireland to make to the whole of our United Kingdom and indeed worldwide, scientifically, medically, industrially, and religiously, for the many missionaries and aid workers who have served with compassion around the globe. We thank you for the significant contribution made by members of the Orange Institution 
to the establishment of Northern Ireland and its continued peace and prosperity. We pray for your blessing upon our Sovereign Lady, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, and for all in positions of authority over us that you would endue them with wisdom, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Remember the health service, we pray, at this critical time. We pray for a spiritual awakening of true Christianity in our land. Therefore, we pray that the realization of your goodness to us as citizens of this country would cause us to be better men and women in our family, religious, social, and civic duties. These petitions we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Saviour. Amen. On behalf of our Grand Master of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland, Most Worshipful Brother Edward Stevenson and the Grand Lodge, we want to express our appreciation to the authorities of Union College for permission to record this service in this historic building. On June the 22nd, 1921, King George V opened the Northern Ireland Parliament in the City Hall. However, the Parliament then moved to Assemblies College, now known as Union. It remained here for 11 years. The Commons met in the College's Gamble Library, and the Senate met in the College Chapel, the room in which we are recording this service. In 1932, the Parliament moved to the uh, purpose-built Parliament buildings at the Stormont Estate. This service was arranged because we recognise from Scripture that we have a duty to God to commemorate this important anniversary. In the Old Testament, God commanded the nation of Israel to keep important anniversaries, especially that of the formation of their nation. Failure to do so would rob God of the glory due unto his name. And also, younger generations needed to know where they came from, to know who they were, so that they could confidently go into the future. We, too, have much to celebrate before God. In his providence, through the courage given to our forefathers, we have remained as part of the United Kingdom. As such, we have been blessed with liberty, peace, and prosperity that citizens of other nations can only envy. A hundred years ago, every Protestant congregation was urged to have special prayer for the opening of the new Parliament. In Belfast, two special services were held on the opening day, one in the Belfast Cathedral and later in the day in the Assembly buildings. At both, Sir James Craig, Prime Minister, and members of Parliament attended. In Belfast Cathedral, the Primate spoke on the text of Scripture, Righteousness exalteth a nation. It is therefore appropriate that we commence this centenary year by following their example. And so we now call upon the Reverend Alistair Smith, Grand Chaplain, to come and read from Scripture and speak to us. Our Scripture reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, reading verses 11 to 25. Let us hear the Word of God. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good 
you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your master with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord, inspired by his Holy Spirit, and may he bless it to all our hearts, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Happy birthday, Northern Ireland. You're doing well to be approaching 100 years old. You were born in blood, and some wanted to kill you off at birth. Others have tried to get rid of you ever since. Some are still plotting to do the same even today. But in 2021, many of us are delighted that you've survived. We're glad to call you home. We're glad to be your citizens. It will come as no surprise that the Orange Institution is planning a series of events to mark the centennial of Northern Ireland. The Orange Order supplied thousands of men for the 36th Ulster Division, and their heroism at the Somme put the British government in their debt to such an extent that they felt obliged to allow the northeast part of Ulster to remain part of the United Kingdom. Members of the Orange family were amongst the most vigorous when it came to contributing to the welfare of Northern Ireland. Has everything within Northern Ireland over the past 100 years been perfect? Of course not. Were mistakes made by all concerned? Yes. Could things have been done differently? Possibly. But then, can you show me any nation where things are always perfect? Of course you can't. So we are happy to commemorate the foundation of this state and to celebrate 100 years of its existence. Just a few moments ago, we read from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 25. And I want to take as a key text the words found in verse 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Those are words, of course, that every orange man will be familiar with, 
because they are found on many orange arches and banners. So I want to take this text and to use it to reflect on how things developed in Northern Ireland. So first then, honour all men. In the New International Version, it's put like this, show proper respect to everyone. It was always the intention of the founding fathers of Northern Ireland that all the people from whatever background, race, or religion should be treated with proper respect. It had been Lord Carson's plea, from the outset, let us see that the Catholic minority have nothing to fear from the Protestant majority. Let us take care to win all that is best among those who have been opposed to us in the past. While maintaining intact our own religion, let us give the same rights to the religions of our neighbours. That was the intention. However, there were some who sulked from the beginning, didn't want to play ball, and complained afterwards that they were marginalised. The 12 anti-partition MPs elected in May 1921 refused to take their seats, while 21 nationalist-controlled local authorities declined to acknowledge the new government and parliament, and instead pledged allegiance to Doyle Aaron. The Roman Catholic clergy fully endorsed this boycott. The Cardinal Archbishop of Armagh and Primate of All Ireland, Michael Lug, declined Craig's invitation to attend the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament on the grounds that he had a previous engagement. He also refused, in the most truculent manner, to participate in a government inquiry into the educational system. And a large number of Roman Catholic school teachers and school managers refused to cooperate with the Northern Ireland Ministry of Education and, like the local authorities, looked instead to Dublin. When the Royal Ulster Constabulary was established, one-third of the places were reserved for the minority community. But not many Roman Catholics joined. They were discouraged from doing so by their church and threatened out of doing so by the IRA. So, it always was the intention of the Founding Fathers to cherish all the citizens of Northern Ireland equally. When, as I say, some, however, not only opted out, but sought to undermine the fledgling state with violence, then measures had to be taken to protect the people and to secure its borders. Over the years, over the past 100 years, all the people of Northern Ireland benefited from many aspects of life. The education system that eventually evolved in Northern Ireland was, and still is, the envy of many. All alike benefited from the generous UK welfare system. And the British National Health Service has been a great blessing to people of all religions and none, and applauded by all, most recently and significantly during the coronavirus pandemic. And the COVID-19 vaccines have been developed and introduced uh, first in the United Kingdom before any other nation of the world. And all the citizens within Northern Ireland will benefit equally from that. Northern Ireland punched above its weight 
in terms of sporting achievement and agricultural output and in a multitude of other ways. Therefore, I think we can say with considerable justification that the state of Northern Ireland sought to honour all men. Secondly, love the brotherhood. Some people opted out of participation in Northern Ireland from the word go. Some actively sought to destroy the fledgling state by boycott, bomb, and bullet. Some, I even at Westminster, did not give Northern Ireland a fair wind. But as we look back over 100 years, we from our hearts want to say thank you to God for all those who stood with us and supported us through thick and thin. We think of stalwarts like Boner Law. We think of Orange Brethren in Glasgow, Liverpool, and elsewhere, who did their best to explain the cause of unionism and who provided moral, financial, and practical support, both at the time of partition and in the more recent troubles from the late 1960s through to the mid-1990s. We should also remember our Unionist friends and Orange Brethren who found themselves somewhat unexpectedly, perhaps, on the southern side of the border. We acknowledge the sacrifice they made and the willingness they showed to work within what was initially the Irish Free State and subsequently the Irish Republic, while at the same time remaining true to their orange principles. It must also, of course, be noted that some from the southern state had to flee from there and found a ready welcome and refuge within Northern Ireland. We are also, of course, thankful to all those Bible-believing Christians who have upheld our country and cause in prayer, and who have lived consistent Christian lives, often in difficult and dangerous circumstances, and sometimes in the face of persecution. They have been examples of what it says here in verse 15 in this passage. It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. As we move forward into 2021 and the years to come, within our order and within our country, let us encourage one another build one another up. In short, let us love the brotherhood. Thirdly, honour the King. This verse we are concentrating on, namely 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, is set in a larger context. Part of that context is described in verses 13 and 14. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. In this passage and elsewhere in Scripture, Christian believers are exhorted to recognize and submit to the governing authorities. Of course, if the governing authorities demand Christians to do anything that is contrary to Scripture and conscience, then Christians must obey God rather than man. But even then, they must accept whatever further punishment the governing authorities deem appropriate. However, 
within the state of Northern Ireland, there was never any justification for resort to violence and terrorism. I believe that any changes that were required would have been achieved through the normal means of democracy, political engagement, and community involvement. Those who sought to overthrow Northern Ireland by murder, mayhem, and bloodshed brought shame on themselves, dishonor to their cause, misery to thousands, and flouted the law of God. On the other side of the coin, many within Northern Ireland proved themselves to be loyal and law-abiding citizens. More than that, more than that, they sacrificed themselves for God and Ulster and Empire and others. For example, during the Second World War, conscription was not introduced in Northern Ireland out of deference to and fear of nationalist opinion. Nevertheless, Craig said, we are king's men, and placed all of Northern Ireland's resources at the disposal of the British government. In spite of that, in spite of that, the British government even toyed with the idea of ending partition in an effort to persuade ERA to end its neutrality and enter the war on the side of the Allies. However, nothing came of that, and in the end, the ports of Northern Ireland stood as a faithful sentinel, helping to protect the sea lanes between Britain and America, particularly the northwest approaches to Merseyside and Clydeside. Churchill was later to acknowledge this when he wrote famously, but for the loyalty of Northern Ireland and its devotion to what has now become the cause of 30 governments or nations, we should have been confronted with slavery and death. And the light which now shines so strongly throughout the world would have been quenched. And of course, before and since that time, we remember with humble pride and sincere gratitude all those who served in the 36th Ulster Division, the Ulster Special Constabulary, the RUC, the UDR, the PSNI, the Royal Irish Regiment, as well as the other regiments of the British Army. We salute the memory of those who fought and died to maintain Northern Ireland's cherished place within the United Kingdom. Therefore today, as in days of yore, we call upon all men and women to honour the King, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Fourthly, and finally, fear God. The fear of man, the Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When the state of Northern Ireland came into existence, Ulster was still a largely God-fearing province. Of course, not everyone was converted, but most people knew the difference between right and wrong. One hundred years on, lots of people have sadly lost their moral compass. Lots of people have lost that sense of God. Many see nothing wrong with drunkenness, gambling, sleeping around, killing babies in the womb, engaging in homosexual and lesbian activity, blasphemy, 
and all the other things so odious in the sight of God. What we therefore need is a renewed sense of the fear of God. When we stand, each one of us, when we stand before a thrice holy God, surely we realize that we are sinners. If today, then, you are already trusting in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then rejoice. Rejoice that God has reached down and gloriously saved you. Because in the words here of the Apostle Peter at verse 25, you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And listen also to what Peter exhorts his readers, and God therefore exhorts God-fearing, Christian-believing people today. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. If, however, on the other hand, you are looking at this service or listening to this service, and you do not have the assurance of salvation in your soul, then I say to you today, fear God. Fear him in the sense of respecting him, reverencing him, holding him in awe. Fear him as the perfectly pure, holy, spotless one who can by no means look upon iniquity. Fear what he will do to you. Fear what will become of you if you neglect such a great salvation. And so I urge you not only to fear God, but to embrace his only begotten Son as your Savior. In 2021, as over the past 100 years, and for the years to come, what men and women in Northern Ireland need to do is to come to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and yield their lives, surrender their lives to him. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Great God of nations, now to thee, our hymn of gratitude we raise. With humble heart and bending thee, we offer thee our song of praise. We praise thee that the gospel light through all our land its radiance shed. Dispel the shades of error's night and heavenly blessings round us spread. Great God, Preserve us in thy fear, in danger still our guardian be. O oh, spread thy truth's bright precepts here. Let all the people worship thee. What Northern Ireland needs in 2021 and for the years to come are people who will honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the King. Amen. And may God bless to all our hearts the preaching of his precious word. When God directed Israel to mark certain anniversaries, he commanded that it be a time of commemoration, celebration, and consecration specifically in light of their blessings they were called upon to make vows. Interestingly, our final hymn also dates from 1921, when music by Gustav Holst was put to a poem by Sir Cecil Rice. It mentions vows. It challenges us that two countries demand our love, loyalty, sacrifice, and service our earthly country, and our heavenly. I vow to thee, my country, may we consciously, before God, 
make our vows to live for the glory of God and the peace and prosperity of Northern Ireland. of the nations, thus to thee, our country we commend. Be thou her refuge and her trust, her everlasting friend. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and abide with us this day and for evermore. Amen. The National Anthem. 